Today's uh, webinar is uh, going to talk about uh, how to change or how to set the IP address of your laptop because that's a fairly crucial uh, ability uh, to be able to uh, plug into our Ethernet based uh, products. And the second part of the session is going to be how to provision and set up GRE tunnels between 645 M-4 cellular modems. When we say provision, we're referring to connecting the, connecting the cellular modem to the carrier, like uh, AT&T or Verizon, T-Mobile or whatnot. Getting the uh, cell modem to connect to the carrier is what we mean by provisioning. Uh, by the way, just a quick introduction. Uh, I'm uh, Brian Cunningham. I provide uh, technical support for uh, the Elpro uh, product line for customers in uh, uh, North America and a little bit of South America as well. And I would be your uh, main technical contact if you had any questions regarding these uh, products, how to wire them, configure them, troubleshoot them, uh, etc. Okay, so. This is the, uh, the product that we're going to talk about today, the uh, 645M-4, uh, it's a 4G cellular router, it also has 3G uh, network uh, fallback, uh, and uh, with these cellular modems, uh, they can be accessed anywhere in the world that you have access to the internet. So what that means is... Uh, if you uh, stick these on uh, vehicles, you can uh, uh, you can find out where the vehicles are located. You can monitor any equipment inside those vehicles. We do a lot of uh, applications with uh, mining machines, uh, just those massive trucks monitoring a whole bunch of variables on those trucks as they're driving around mine sites. Uh, you can also connect these uh, cellular modems to something like a, uh, a very high-end, very large, uh, HVAC system that will be shipped off to a, uh, a building somewhere in the country and then installed on the roof. And if there's any issues with the uh, with the machinery, you can log into the cellular model connected to it and see what's uh, happening with all the uh, the parameters inside of the HVAC uh, machine, for example. And that can be done from anywhere. That could be done from a uh, technician sitting uh, in a hotel room anywhere in the country. That could be done at home from your home internet uh, connection as well. So there are literally thousands of different applications for uh, cellular uh, modems. Now, one thing uh, we always like to throw this uh, slide up because these numbers do surprise uh, uh, people periodically. And uh, what this uh, what this is this is a spreadsheet that compares the lifetime costs of using a cellular modem versus using a UHF radio, such as our uh, 945 or uh, maybe the 245 or something like that. Uh, and it's interesting to compare. Now, keep in mind, this is only applicable if all of the remote sites are within range of a UHF radio network. Now, if they're not, they're spread all over the country, or they're in, uh, you know, one side of a mountain going to the other side of a mountain, or just uh, simply distances that are beyond what a UHF radio can do, then, of course, we, we don't have any other option. But we uh, did a comparison for a, uh, uh, a campus in California, and they were considering using cellular modems, and we pointed out uh, the lifetime cost of using the cellular modems versus using an Ethernet pass-through modem, such as our 945U-E. And while the hardware cost was substantially lower for the 645M-4, when we looked at the, uh, the monthly data costs for each site, and then we looked at the cost of getting a, uh, a, a, a VPN, uh, access to those cellular uh, modems, and you multiplied it over over an estimated 10-year uh, time frame, we found that in this case, uh, going with a UHF radio was substantially cheaper. The other thing to, uh, to always keep in mind is that uh, uh, just as we thought 3G service would probably be around for just about just about forever, well, carriers are gradually discontinuing 3G service, especially as 5G service comes out. 
So a given uh, level of service like 3G or 4G may have a 10 year lifespan before that service is phased out by the carrier. And of course, that's something to factor in is uh, how long will the carrier maintain that, uh, that service there. Now, of course, lots of cases you won't have any, uh, there won't be any choice. Cellular is the only practical option uh, to go. And so that's what we're going to talk about uh, uh, today is how we set up our cellular modems. <clears throat> uh, step one or part one of this is uh, changing the IP address of your laptop so that you can communicate with the cellular modem, but so that you can log into it, as well as you'll need to be able to do this for, uh, for almost all of our other radios, which are now all Ethernet-based uh, radios. A couple of basic rules here. You have to set it to the same uh, subnet as the radio's Ethernet port, but it must be set to a different IP address than the radio. Now, here's what the default radio IP addresses are for uh, all of these products here, the 245, 945, et cetera, et cetera, they all follow the same convention. When you get them from the factory, they're all set to 192.168.0.xyz, where XYZ can range from 100 to 199. On the other hand, the 645M-4 is set to 192.168.1.1. What we're going to show you here is how to set your laptop to 192.168.0.5. Uh, and because this doesn't conflict with any of the radio's IP addresses, it won't uh, overlap with any of these, nor uh, this IP address here. We will also show you how to create a rule so that you can switch between 192.168.0 and .1 subnets without having to make any change to your laptop. And you can enter a bunch of these rules if you have other Ethernet-based uh, equipment, and it just makes uh, life uh, a lot simpler, a lot easier. Okay, so uh, this is going to show Windows 10. So we just start with uh, click on your Windows Start menu, then we click on uh, Settings uh, down here. Then this will show you your uh, uh, the settings uh, uh, section or settings menu rather. Then we click on Network and Internet. And then within that menu, we click on change adapter options. Now I've uh, had uh, Teams calls where customers have shared their screens and this change adapter option sometimes is over on the, the right hand side here. Uh, sometimes it's in different locations depending on the versions of Windows, but we want to find out where change adapter options is and we want to double click on that. Once we have our uh, network uh, connections there, uh, we're going to uh, possibly see a couple of different uh, network options on this computer. And you might wonder which one is the RJ45 Ethernet jack on the side of my computer. And one way to tell is uh, the one that has to have the word Ethernet in the name. So that's gonna narrow it down to one of these two guys uh, here. And by the way, these are all ports for how your computer connects to the outside world. It can either connect, in my case, uh, this computer can connect via Bluetooth or the physical RJ45 jack on the side. Uh, this is a virtual connection, and this is the Wi-Fi connection to my Wi-Fi hotspot here. One of the ways you can tell uh, which one of these Ethernet uh, ports is the one that uh, correlates to the physical RJ45 port is to make sure that the uh, the cellular modem is powered up or uh, you could use any Ethernet based uh, device as long as it's powered on and plug a cable between it and your laptop. When the cable is plugged in, you should see uh, this uh, type of image right here or in some versions of Windows it shows a green check mark. And then when you disconnect to the cable, you should see the red X reappear. So by plugging in and unplugging the Ethernet cable, you can figure out which one of these is the RJ45 jack on your uh, computer. Once you have figured that out, double click on this uh, icon, icon here. Okay, then you'll see uh, this, uh, uh, this menu, oh, sorry, no, you'll see this menu uh, pop up right here. 
and uh, we want to click on properties. Uh, then we will see this menu uh, appear right here, and we want to click on Internet Protocol version 4, and then we want to click on properties down here. This will show uh, this screen right here. Now, there's two options for getting an IP address. One of them is uh, obtain an IP address automatically. And that's normally what you would use if you had a RJ45, uh, if you had an Ethernet cable plugged directly into your Wi Fi router. So, in that case, the Wi Fi router assigns IP addresses to uh, all of the equipment connected to it and your computer would be uh, one of them. However, for our purpose, we need to have a fixed uh, IP address. So we uh, put a uh, click right here, use the following IP address. We uh, enter our desired IP address. We just click with the mouse in the subnet mask, and this will automatically fill in 255.255.255.0. For the default gateway, uh, you can leave this blank for uh, most of the products. Uh, however, uh, for the, uh, the cellular modem, we'd recommend you enter in the LAN IP address of the cellular modem. Now, just to, uh, I'm going to talk about this a little more in just a minute, but cellular modems have two IP addresses. They have one for the, the uh, RJ45 jack, the uh, LAN port on the radio. And then they have a second IP address, which is the cellular IP address associated with the SIM card. Okay, so we want to enter the LAN IP address. So the LAN IP address of the, uh, uh, the 645, the default is 192.168.1.1. So we would enter that uh, in this box uh, right here. Okay, we don't need to put anything uh, down here. And now I talked about how to create a rule so that you can switch between uh, subnets without having to go into this, this menu uh, uh, on your network uh, settings. What you would do is you would click Advance. In the Advanced menu, you'll see these options right here. We would click on Add, and then you'll see this menu pop right here, pop up right here. So in this case, what we'll do is we'll type in our our new IP address. So now we've got 192.168.1.5 as well as 0.5. So we can access anything on either .1 or .0 subnets. We enter the subnet mask as shown, uh, click add, and then you'll see that appear in this list. And you can add multiple devices, uh, multiple IP addresses rather, uh, to your list. Okay, then we hit OK, we hit OK, and uh, OK, I think a third time as well to back out of all these options to uh, <coughs> complete the process. Okay, so once you're able to uh, set the IP address on your uh, laptop, uh, we need to start to have a quick chat about public versus private IP addresses on the SIM card that you're going to insert into the cellular modem. Uh, public IP addresses can be accessed by anyone on the internet, uh, whereas private IP addresses uh, cannot. And therefore, private addresses, private IP addresses can be reused. Just like uh, every town has a, uh, a main, you know, a, a main street. But uh, since, uh, uh, since every town is, uh, has a different name, uh, there would be no confusion. There's no mixing up the main streets uh, of different towns. Then. Uh, <clears throat> now, here are all the private IP addresses that are out there. Okay, now we have uh, class A, B, and C. Uh, the only difference is just uh, the range of, uh, of IP addresses. But if you see any other IP address, it is a public IP address. Okay. So that's why we can have uh, thousands or literally millions of devices with uh, the same, uh, you know, the same uh, IP address right here. And that's because they're on private networks, so they will never see each other. Uh, so, uh, yeah, yeah, very interesting, uh, very important to understand the difference between public and private IP addresses. Okay, so if you have a cellular modem with a public IP address, 
you can ping it via the ethernet, via the internet, if you know what that IP address is. Uh, this website, network-tools, is uh, one of several that offers uh, some uh, tools that allow you to be able to uh, ping and, and do all kinds of different network uh, diagnostics. Uh, if you have a, uh, a, a SIM from your carrier that has a private uh, IP, then that means you have to, first of all, log into the carrier's uh, uh, network. Usually this is done uh, by connecting a VPN. So it's uh, just like if you went to work for any large company and you're uh, working from home, uh, they will have installed VPN software on your computer. So the first thing you do is you run that VPN software, and then you are connected to that company's uh, internal network. It's the same thing with uh, cellular modems. So uh, if you uh, want to dial into your cellular modem or you want to connect to that PLC that's plugged into the cell modem at a remote site, you have to install VPN software on your computer. Or that could be uh, on a phone or on a tablet or, or whatnot there. Now keep in mind, uh, uh, carriers usually have a small charge for VPN software usage. So uh, one carrier I've heard of will uh, allow three VPN uh, devices, like uh, you know uh, three computers, uh, and they charge uh, twenty-four dollars a month to uh, have those three devices uh, uh, access to their uh, network. Uh, but if we're just connecting something like uh, PLCs together. Uh, there is no need to use a VPN. We can just use GRE tunnels. Uh, now, it's important that we make sure that all of these SIM cards are from the same carrier so that they're all inside of the same uh, network. Okay? So, <clears throat> uh, now we, uh, we call these devices uh, cellular routers. And uh, what we mean by uh, router is that it will pass data, it will route the data between networks. So in this case here, uh, I've got a IP address of 10.17.152, et cetera, and uh, I have a, uh, the, on the RJ45 port, the, uh, the, WAN, sorry, the LAN IP, rather, is 192.168.0. You know whatever I uh, set it to. Sorry, this should say LAN IP uh, address here. And what the cellular modem is doing is it's routing the traffic that's coming over the cellular network to the Ethernet uh, or to the RJ45 port. So uh, it's uh, it's routing this traffic between the two. So that's what we call it a uh, a cellular router. Device. Okay, so um, uh, to keep in mind, uh, we generally would recommend for GRE tunnels that you use a private uh, IP address on the SIM cards. And this is because uh, it's much more secure. Nobody can, uh, uh, can access it from the internet. And uh, if you have a public IP address, then they, once they uh, can figure out what the IP address is, the only thing protecting your cell modem is just the user and the password. So uh, not a lot of security, and that's why they uh, usually use more secure methods when uh, they uh, must use uh, public IP addresses. So there's other things like IPsec and other methods of uh, making your modem uh, more secure. But we're not, uh, we're not going to be talking about that today. We're going to be talking about how we get our cellular modem connected to the carrier. Okay. Now, if you have a uh, if you have factory defaulted the 645M-4, uh, the uh, cellular modem will uh, act as the DHCP server and it will provide IP addresses to the computer that plugs into it. Therefore, in our network settings, we have to make sure that our computer is set to obtain an IP address automatically. So you've got to put a check, uh, tick mark uh, in this box uh, right here. Okay, now the steps for provisioning the modem. You must insert the SIM card into the slot at the back of the uh, modem. It's a uh, uh, 15 by 25 millimeter uh, SIM card. We apply power to the modem. We plug an Ethernet cable into the, uh, sorry, that should say the LAN port on the uh, radio. 
We set the laptop to obtain an IP address uh, automatically, and then we run our browser, like Firefox or Internet Explorer. <clears throat> then uh, what we do is we type in the IP address of the, uh, of the cell modem, the 192.168.1.1, and up pops our login page. Okay? The default logins are admin and admin all lowercase. Okay, so uh, the first thing we have to do is uh, we have to uh, go to our setup wizard. So we click on system, then we click on setup wizard, and then we have the very first uh, couple of steps. Now you can change the password if you like. Um, uh, this is where that would be uh, done, the user, or the password settings rather. And then we need to tell the cell modem what time zone we're in. And that's about it. That's the most important uh, piece of information on this page. Okay. Oh, uh, then we, yeah, sorry, we go to step two. On the previous one, after you finished all that, you go to uh, step two, or uh, uh, at the bottom of the screen, just off here, it uh, has save and next. So it saves that setting. You move to the next tab. Then you have to enter the APN. And uh, this is something that the SIM provider will uh, will tell you what, what APN to use. And this stands for access point name. So in this particular case, uh, I got the uh, SIM cards from a company called M2M -M Wireless. And they said, this is, the, uh, this is the APN that you have to enter in this box. Okay, everything else is not really uh, that important. Uh, we uh, then once we're finished this, we click on step three to go to the LAN. Okay, so this determines uh, how you log into the modem. Now, the default is to enable DHCP, which means that uh, over here, uh, we uh, just need to make sure that it obtains an IP address automatically. If we disable this, uh, then we would need to make sure that our laptop is set to a fixed IP address on the same subnet as this IP, but different. So, for example, I would set my uh, laptop to 192.168.1.5, and then I can log into this uh, radio by typing in this same IP address. So, two options for how you log in. Depends on whether you have a tick box in enable DHCP or not. Okay, <clears throat> then we click uh, save and next and uh, move to uh, step four, uh, the Wi Fi. Now, the 645 4 also has a, uh, a Wi Fi radio inside. And so we have the option we could connect to it from my computer wirelessly uh, via Wi Fi. Uh, now, uh, so this might have some conveniences uh, because you, you don't have to have a cable out and you can just uh, log directly into the cell modem for configuration or, uh, you know, diagnostics or whatnot there. And uh, we had one customer that really liked this because they would drive out to these uh, remote sites and he would just sit in his pickup truck and he would log into the cell modem and he didn't have to step out of the truck. Uh, and it was uh, really quite uh, convenient for him. You know, you don't have to, it's a bit of a hassle dealing with these internet cables. You'd have to open up the enclosure, plug in the cables, uh, you know, stand there awkwardly trying to balance his laptop. Uh, now he just basically sits inside of his air conditioned uh, pickup truck and uh, logs right in, does not need to open up the enclosure. So it, it can be quite uh, convenient. Anyway, these are all the settings. This is the SSID. So when you go to connect to a Wi-Fi network and you see the name of it, uh, like, you know, at a coffee shop up here, uh, it's a called a Stayed Coffee Shop. Uh, their SSID is just called Stayed Coffee. So this is whatever you'd like to be. So you could make, maybe make this uh, 645N-1 uh, uh, cell modem or something of that sort. Yeah, then we have the transmit power, the uh, frequency band. You, you really don't need to change any of these. But the only one you would really uh, need to change would just be your, uh, your encryption key. So this is the encryption key. Uh, once you try to log in, you have to type this into your, uh, uh, type this into your, uh, uh, into your laptop to be able to log into this Wi-Fi hotspot. 
Okay. Uh, oh, yeah, and you should set the country code as well. Uh, just to make sure that you're not uh, using any frequencies that are uh, that are only designated for European use or other countries. Yet. Okay, so once you've done this, and keep in mind the wireless, uh, the Wi-Fi configuration is optional. We uh, click uh, finish. We uh, wait about two minutes for the radio to uh, reboot with its uh, settings and. It doesn't take two minutes to reboot, but we uh, it takes uh, a little bit of time for it to connect to the carrier. So the radio reboots in less than a minute, uh, but it might take an extra 30 seconds or so for it to uh, connect to uh, you know AT&T or, or whomever. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> then you can uh, log back into the uh, radio, and the home page that it takes you to is your status uh, overview. The thing that you're looking for is you want to make sure your cellular status is up. If the cellular status is up, it means it's got a connection to the uh, to the carrier, and you uh, you should be good good to go. Now, uh, this is the IP address, the cellular IP address of uh, this uh, SIM card inside of the uh, inside of my uh, radio here, and. Uh, note that it is a private IP address uh, because it is in the range of 10 dot uh, xxx etc. And as long as it's in this range, it will be a private IP address and cannot be pinged or accessed from anybody on the internet. On the radio itself, uh, you should see the signal LED should be flashing blue and the faster it flashes it means the stronger the cellular uh, signal and the cellular led on the radio should be solid yellow so once we've got that done then we have our uh, device connected to the uh, to the carrier's uh, network okay now it'll be important to uh, write down what this ip address is here because we're going to need it in the next uh, couple of steps we're also going to need to know what the LAN IP address of the cell modem is, of, of every cell modem that we're going to set up. Okay, so uh, the next part is setting up uh, GRE tunnels. And I uh, just wanted to uh, uh, show you, uh, whoops, um, I just wanted to show you uh, the OSI uh, model. Now, normally it's a seven layer uh, model. And uh, uh, but uh, in the case of what we're dealing with, the TCP IP encompasses the uh, layers uh, 5, 6, and 7. So we're just going to talk about five layers, five important layers here, and where a GRE tunnel fits in. Uh, it's going to fit into layer 3. And basically, uh, uh, generic GRE tunnels, that stands for Generic Routing Encapsulation. And what it is, is it's a tunneling protocol that encapsulates a wide range of network layer protocols inside of a point-to-point -point link. Uh, there's some uh, big benefits to using uh, GRE tunnels in that it allows multicast packets to traverse across a network and also allows routing of multiple subnets. So, uh, GRE tunnel is just a, one way to think of it. It's just a pipe that uh, connects two cell modems uh, together. And uh, it essentially uh, mimics, uh, if you had this Ethernet cable here, if you could run it for miles and miles and miles directly into the opposite uh, PLC in this case here. So uh, uh, let's see, some of the, but there's a couple of rules that we have to uh, uh, be aware of here, but we have to keep this in mind, and that is the the LAN IP addresses of the cell modems must be on a different subnet. So uh, that means uh, 192.168.1, the next uh, cell modem 192.168.2, and the next cell modem 192.168.3, uh, etc. Uh, and then uh, each uh, GRE tunnel uh, needs a local GRE tunnel IP address. And this is more or less just a reference uh, IP address. It doesn't really have much uh, consequence, but it should be unique. 
And the uh, PLCs or the computers or whatever is plugged into uh, your cell modems, they need to have their gateway IP address set to the LAN IP address of the respective 645 M-4. So the gateway IP address, that is set in the same menu where you set the IP address of your laptop. There's usually three parameters. One is the actual IP address, then the subnet mask, then the gateway IP. And the gateway IP in your PLC has to be set to the LAN IP address of the cellular modem. So kind of an important rule, uh, it's a bit of a hiccup there. By the way, uh, I just wanted to mention, um, we can do point to point with GRE tunnels, we can do point to multi-point, uh, we can basically do any kind of setup. It's just that each ton, each uh, link needs to be set up uh, individually. So we can have multi-point to multi-point. You know, any network layout is possible. You just enter more and more GRE uh, tunnels. Okay. So uh, some of the basics there. And uh, here's the example that we're going to walk through. Okay. Now we're going to uh, assume we have a uh, a laptop at your uh, office location, and this is your master uh, radio here, uh, and we have two remote sites. And of course, we could have dozens or hundreds of, uh, of remote sites. And at each uh, remote site, uh, there is a PLC connected to the, uh, to the cellular modem. Now, this could be anything here. Uh, this could be one of our 915U2 radios connected to a bunch of others. This could be a 945 Ethernet pass-through modem, re, uh, uh, relay data from other 945s at remote sites. Uh, uh, it could be anything with an Ethernet port. It could be our 115E Ethernet uh, I.O. expansion modules, and uh, it could have a bunch of 4 to 20 milliamp signals wired in here. And then using Modbus from your laptop, you could pull all those 4 to 20 milliamp values. So this could be anything. And we could have multiple pieces of equipment all connecting to the same uh, uh, same network and all these remote sites. Okay, so a couple of things I'm going to uh, point out right here. The LAN IP address of the computer, 192.168.1.100. The LAN uh, IP address of the cell modem here is uh, on the, is the dot one. Okay. Then we have the uh, <clears throat> LAN IP similarly at the remote site. The LAN IP is the different, uh, I, uh, different subnet from uh, this guy over here. So he is uh, dot two. And similarly, uh, on this case here, we have the LAN IP address of the PLC is dot two dot X. So it can easily communicate with this guy. And its gateway IP address is also uh, set to the LAN IP address of this one right here. We have the same thing down here, gateway IP address set to the LAN IP address of the cellular modem here. Okay, And then we have the cellular IPs. These would have come from the carrier. So this one, uh, they're all uh, on the same subnet, but I don't think it really matters that much as long as they're all private IP address, uh, private IP addresses from the same carrier. So we've got this guy is uh, dot 74, this guy's dot 70, this guy's dot 72, uh, etc. Now, uh, something else uh, to note is we have the names of the GRE tunnels. And these, uh, these I believe, can be anything. I, I don't think there is any particular convention on what can and cannot be used. But I would suggest, uh, for caution's sake, I would not use uh, any IP address that's being used by anything else. Okay, so we're going to set up one GRE tunnel going out from the master to remote number one. So this is a one way uh, flow of data, and it's going to be GRE tunnel number 10.0.0.1. Then we're going to set up a second GRE tunnel going in one direction out to this remote site, and we're going to give it a different uh, IP address or a different name is really all it is. Then we're going to set up a uh, GRE tunnel in remote number one to go back to the master. And of course, it has a different and a unique GRE tunnel, and it does not have to be on the same subnet or anything. Again, I'm not too clear on if there are any limitations. 
uh, for these tunnel names, I cannot seem to to uh, uh, just see if there are any rules uh, against that. And we're also going to set up another Fury tunnel from this remote to head back here. Now, once we're finished, these two guys will not be able to communicate. Uh, we have not set up GRE tunnels between them, so they will not be able to communicate with each other, but we could certainly do so. If you ever had data that needed to go from this PLC to this PLC, no problem at all. We just set up a GRE tunnel going in one way, and then another GRE tunnel uh, to get data back. Okay, <clears throat> so we're going to log. Uh, we're going to have logged into the uh, master 645m-1, and we're going to click on services, and then we're going to click on VPN, and then we're going to go to the GRE tunnel tab. The next step is we just type in a name for this GRE instance, and we click add. Once we have uh, uh, added it, then we click edit to begin to, uh, uh, to edit the parameters. Okay, first thing we have to do is we have to click enable to enable this GRE tunnel. And then we have to enter the peer IP address. And this is the cellular IP address of remote number one. Okay, then we have to enter in the remote LAN subnet. And this is the LAN IP address of remote 645 number one. Okay. Uh, then uh, the only last thing we have to do is we just need to enter a local tunnel IP. And then again, this is just the name of that uh, of that um, uh, of, of the uh, the jury tunnel that we're creating. Okay. Now I want to see if I can go. Uh, let's see. Oh, <laughs> I was going to try to go backwards, but I think we uh, hopefully understand the, the local tunnel uh, IP concept. That's just the name. Okay. And then we hit uh, save and apply, and we uh, hit reset to reboot the uh, cell motor once we've set up this uh, tunnel. Everything else you can just leave at the factory uh, defaults here. Okay. Uh, remote number two. <clears throat> Oh, let's see. Oh, uh, sorry. I think I've. Uh, let me try going back a slide or two here to make sure I haven't missed anything. Because um, oh, there we go. Master two remote. So we're setting up three tunnels. Um, and uh, here we go. This local tunnel IP. It's it's just this name right here. That's just basically the name of the GRE uh, tunnel. Um, so this is the master to remotes. Then we need to log into the remote number one, the 645 at remote site number one. We need to set its GRE tunnel up to go back to the master. Again, we click enable. We enter the peer IP address. This is the cellular IP address of the master 645 M-4 radio. Then we have to enter the LAN subnet. Uh, of the uh, the master 645M dash radio. Okay. <clears throat> uh, then we have to enter a local tunnel IP. Again, it's just a unique IP address that is not uh, duplicated by anything else. Then we hit save and apply, and we reset the motor. Okay. Then we do almost the exact same on remote uh, number two. So this is. Uh, uh, this is uh, remote 645M-4, uh, 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 the remote, remote number two radio. Okay, now we need to set the peer uh, IP address, and this is the cellular IP address of the master radio, and this is the uh, LAN IP address of the master radio. Then we just create another local tunnel, just a unique IP address. Nothing uh, fancy. We hit save and apply, and then we reset the radio. Okay. Uh, one other setting that we will uh, have to do on uh, all of the modems here is uh, for testing. Uh, we want to make sure that uh, we allow uh, uh, messages to pass through the cellular modem. 
So what we have to do is, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to do a ping test uh, from the laptop out to the PLCs uh, to make sure that we can pass data all the way through the network. So what we have to do is we have to click uh, network, we have to click firewall, then we have to click on the security tab, and we have to change this ping from the uh, wireless from the cellular network to the uh, to the local area network. We have to change it to allow. Otherwise, uh, any ping messages you'll be able to ping the radio, but you won't be able to ping uh, the PLC connected to the radio because it'll block. Okay. And uh, lastly, if we want to access the uh, cell modem over the air, we're going to have to change this setting down here, HTTP access, uh, change it from deny to allow. The factory default is to deny access. So this is where you would change it so you can log into this cell modem if you, uh, if you ever had uh, the need to. Uh, and of course, you have to set up a VPN because it's on a uh, private IP address. But if it were a public IP address, you can just run your browser uh, from anywhere in the world that you have an internet connection, type in the public cellular IP address of that modem, uh, and then enter your uh, user and password, and you can log right in, as long as you have this changed from deny to allow. Okay. <clears throat> so once we have our, uh, once we have our uh, uh, connections all uh, set up, we, uh, in this example, we connect the laptop with an IP address of 192.168.1.100. We set the default gateway to the LAN IP address of the 645 that's connected to it. And then we do a ping command. We ping um, the, uh, the remote uh, modem, and we also ping the remote uh, uh, PLC connecting to it. Now, this example, this is just an illustration of a typical ping uh, command. It's, it's not illustrated because this one is actually showing extremely fast response times because it was over a hardwired uh, network. But your pings could be around one to two seconds, depending on the carrier network. Uh, some carriers a little faster. Some areas have stronger signal, uh, faster coverage. Uh, it'll be a little bit faster if you're out in the uh, boondocks uh, where coverage is poor. Uh, the pings could be uh, could be quite a bit uh, more. So now one of the things uh, uh, about these routers is that uh, they route the traffic. So you could uh, uh, you could in fact have all your modems on uh, um, on the same subnet, but it, it doesn't really matter. They they could be on any uh, any private IP addresses there. So very very uh, capable, very powerful uh, network. And once you've got the whole network uh, set up, this is what you could be doing here. Uh, at your uh, master site here, this was a, uh, a network with, uh, uh, where they were monitoring these uh, liquid storage tanks where they stored fracking fluids. And anytime a, uh, the tank got low, they would dispatch a truck. Uh, the company was in the business of supplying uh, oil companies with fracking fluids. And previously, what they had done was that uh, the driver just had a route. He would just drive to every remote site continuously and uh, fill the tanks up and then head back to uh, uh, the base. But some sites uh, did not need, uh, didn't use nearly as much fluid. So it was a little bit of a wasteful process. So they installed level transmitters on the uh, fracking fluid tanks. They uh, stuck our 900 megahertz uh, 915 U2 radios, which formed a, uh, a mesh network in the field, and they got the data to a location that had good cellular coverage. I believe this, this was someplace in Wyoming. So uh, lots of areas there have no cellular coverage, but they would get it to a location that did have good cellular coverage, and then they could get all that information uh, back to their head office where they could only dispatch trucks to just the remote sites that needed the tanks being fluid, uh, being filled. And obviously that represented a huge savings in mileage and uh, wear and tear and hours, uh, labor hours uh, for the company. And of course, uh, it was a, quite a large uh, company and uh, obviously their IT department had some issues with uh, allowing a cellular modem onto the network. So we uh, set a separate cellular modem up 
in their head office. And we just set up GRE tunnels out to all the remote uh, cellular modems. And then they had a dedicated computer that was not connected to their corporate network for this purpose. That meant that we didn't have to talk to anybody in the IT department because we were no longer connecting uh, something to their corporate uh, network. So that was a great way to go about it. And that's one of the, uh, uh, one of the nice things about uh, being able to use these GRE tunnels is uh, they used a dedicated cell modem at the head office and they did not have to get their IT department uh, involved. Anyway, there are literally uh, thousands of different uh, applications. Uh, you can monitor huge pieces of machinery uh, as they travel around the country, like uh, those uh, gigantic mining trucks or these huge HVAC uh, systems that uh, uh, fit on the back of an 18-wheeler. Uh, there we have uh, a company, a power company in uh, Utah is, uh, is doing load shedding with individual cellular modems with uh, certain houses have uh, volunteered to have their uh, electric hot water tanks uh, shut off for uh, brief periods of time uh, when there is high demand on the network. And uh, so they, uh, uh, they use these cell modems for, in that case, uh, load shedding uh, purposes. But literally thousands of applications uh, for these uh, cellular modems here. 